Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rob Martin. Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into what makes athletes who they are. This is episode six. Today's guest has a background in outrunning everybody and is currently a Division I cross country and track and field head coach and director for men's and women's. His accomplishments are as follows. He is a four-time Michigan High School Athletic Association state champion. He was a Foot Locker High School finalist in 1994. He is a three-time NCAA Division I All-American at Indiana University. In 2002, he was ranked 35th in the world in the steeplechase. In 2003, for Team USA at the Pan Am Games, he placed 4th in the steeple. In 2001 at the Goodwill Games, he placed 8th in the steeple. And also in 2001... He was the U.S. champion in the steeplechase. Yes, he was the fastest U.S. man in the steeple, for those that don't know. And if that would have been an Olympic year, he would have represented Team USA. As a coach for Miami University, he has continued his excellence and has been named Coach of the Year for multiple years. He has had many MAC individual champions and a team title as well. If I kept reading all his accomplishments, we would be here for hours. Our guest today is Tom Chorney, who resides in Ohio, is from Michigan, and he loves to try to keep up with me on the bike when we get a chance. (laughs) Welcome, Tom. I'm excited and have been looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for having me. I'll try to keep up with you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I like to poke a little bit. It's kind of fun. All right, we're going to dive right in. First question. If you had to pick a race to do right now in order to save your dog, Ted, that you had to win, what would it be? Here are the three options. First, a 26-mile mountain bike race against me, a (laughs) a 50-mile road bike race against me, or last but not least, a running race up a sand dune against me The first person to reach 25 climbs wins. I mean, I'd have to pick the sand dune just because I think I would have a chance. Right now, you would definitely bury me on the mountain bike. You know that. But uh, the 50-mile ride, I mean, I'd I'd finish it. I definitely wouldn't be too fast. So, yeah, I'd have to pick the sand dune. I had a feeling that was going to be the pick. (laughs) And and I you still you might be able to beat me in that. I think I remember we were at Hoffmaster one time doing something crazy up a really steep dune and I just I couldn't keep up with you at that time. Yeah. That's back to the origins for the for my running career there. Right? (laughs) Yep, Hoffmaster State Park. We're gonna talk about the steeplechase. And I'd like you to touch on the steeplechase, and maybe you could explain exactly what it is for those that don't know. Why don't we start with the summer after my senior year of high school, graduated in 95 from Fruitport in Muskegon there, and I was working at the new Lowe's that just went in on Sherman Boulevard. And I was at work, I worked in the home decor section, and I had to walk past the TVs that they had set up. They used to sell TVs. And I I walked past and the world championships were on from 1995. And I happened to see the race that was on the TV and and they showed these distance runners and they were jumping these barriers. And I had no idea what that was. And I I literally stopped and I backpedaled and I was like, what is this race? And so I sat there and I watched it. And as soon as I realized, like, this is a 3000 meter race, it's jumping things. I was like, that's my event. So I knew right away, like, this is going to be my event. Essentially, yeah, 3,000 meters on the outdoor track, seven and a half laps, and each lap has five barriers. The barriers are not like hurdles, so they are solid. They're literally six by four blocks of wood, typically, and they're wrapped in that rubber Mondo track surface. Sometimes they are just wood, and you can jump off of them. You can stand on them. They're really solid. They definitely don't topple over when you hit them. So five jumps per lap. One of those jumps has a water pit after it. The water pit is 12 feet long and right past the barrier, the water pit is about two and a half feet deep. And then 
the further you go out, the shallower the water. So it angles back up to the track surface. When I got to Indiana University, cross country is in the fall, track is in the spring. And I remember in the fall, I told Coach Bell, so I was legendary coach Sam Bell at Indiana. I told him that I wanted to run the steeplechase. And he just kind of looked at me and laughed. And he said, well, that's an outdoor track event. This is cross country season. So let's just worry about cross country. (laughs) So, and then I had to wait for months before I could jump. So you said right away when you saw that, that's going to be for you. Yeah. What, what made you decide and why to do the steeple? Well, I really did not like track and field. I actually didn't like running. I didn't want to be a runner. I think I always, you know, I tell a lot of people and even in my like cover letters, when I, (laughs) if I applied to Miami, I'm sure my cover letter said as a kid, I thought that I was going to, I knew I was going to be an athlete. I just didn't know what sport. I, I tried to be a basketball player. I tried to avoid being a runner for quite a while and When you've got talents that just kind of keep directing you towards a sport, sometimes you have to just submit to it and admit, okay, yeah, maybe I'm a runner. So I loved cross country. Once I got to that point where it's like, okay, I'm going to try running. Um, I loved cross. I liked the hills. I liked that type of challenge. But I was so bored on the track. I did not want to run the mile. I didn't want to run the two mile. And I did that. I still won a couple state titles, you know, being really bored with track. I mean, I enjoyed the competition, you know, give me that challenge. And okay, there was definitely some fulfillment there. But when I saw that, for some reason, I guess it just resonated with me. And I thought, okay, I can bring an element of cross country to my track season. And I just knew that that would have given me, I guess, that that additional challenge that I needed to make it enjoyable. That makes perfect sense. I'm, I was in the same boat. I loved cross country and I despised track. <laughs> just running in circles just didn't do it for me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had a cinder track back then too. So, I mean, I don't know if I knew any different, but it's funny to look back and think, wow, I, you know, my high school years were all spent on a cinder track. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you walk us through the race in 2001 at U.S. Championships and your win? I can walk you through some parts of that weekend. For me, my running career was a little interesting because there were races when I could get done. And and even years later, I can remember almost every single aspect of that race. But then there's other races where I know the outcome and the results, but I didn't remember that much of it. So what I remember about that week, it would have been June in 2001 and it would have been my first full year out of college. So I was still working under coach uh, Robert Chapman had taken over at Indiana once coach Bell retired. And uh, Chapman is a fantastic coach. He's a scientist. He's one of the smartest guys I've known. And we had already the year before, we had gone through the 2000 Olympic trials and we really were just on the same page with our training and, and what I needed. And he, he had really started to understand me as an athlete. And so we brought that into the 2001 season. And I was really confident going into the trials. So there was a trial round and then two days later was the final, assuming that you advanced to the final. And I remember cruising through the the trials and I had run, I think, 827 to advance. Maybe it was was slower. It might have been 835. And I knew that I had to be top five and I had to be under you know, 836 in order to advance. So I didn't, I didn't really bother with trying to be one of the top three in my heat. I just kind of hung back and I was looking at the clock and I I was making sure nobody was coming up from behind me. So I just cruised in. So nobody would have thought, okay, Chorney's looking really good. You know, he's going to be a favorite. Nobody would have thought that after the trials, but going into the, to the final, we had been training almost the entire year with the idea that, you know, based on history, this race is going to go, it's going to take about 822 to make it to the top three and the top three get selected for the world championships that year. We trained for a race that was going to go out at 830 pace, which is 415 at the halfway point. So four, four minutes, 15 seconds at 1500. And then it's going to close. People are going to pick up the pace and it's probably going to go 407 for a total time of 822. So we trained for that. We, we trained with that pace change. We trained to be able to handle 407 for 1500. And I remember like clockwork, halfway through that race, 
I had probably placed myself in the top six for the majority of that race just to stay out of the, the, the way of the other 10 athletes or so. And, uh, 1500 meters in somebody picked up the pace and I was like, Oh, this is perfect. You know, right on, right on schedule. It's exactly what we trained for. And I went with the top three and I really don't remember a lot about that race because I think I was so caught up in just following the plan and going with the top three. And, and my main focus was just keep connection. And Tim bro was a very, very good runner at that time, Anthony Famoletti, and then myself. And then there were other athletes who were, were definitely capable athletes, but none of them had shown really standout races or results yet. So I knew that I was going to be somebody that was going to be hard to beat. You can actually find the last 500 meters on YouTube. So you can see the last 500 meters of the race, but I don't remember being able to find that coverage on YouTube up until just this last year, which is kind of crazy. So it's nice to look back. So now I remember, because I can see the last 500 meters, I was in third place and doing everything I could just to maintain that top three finish. Those barriers seem to get higher and higher, the tire, the more tired you get later in the race. And going into the final water jump, I had moved into second place in front of Tony Famoletti. And we're coming around the corner for the last home stretch, 100 meters. And Tim Bro had us by 10 meters or so. So he was going to win the race if he <laughs> jumped that last barrier and didn't fall, which didn't happen. He nicked his front toe. He tumbled over that barrier. And I think Tony and I both were like, oh, my gosh, what just happened? And I was in a position where I was in second place, where I was able to go on the inside. Like I stayed in lane one. Tony had to go a little bit outside and around him into lane two or three. And I remember looking up and seeing the finish line, the the, the tape across the finish line. And I was like, is this real? You know, I remember the crowd going nuts because you could hear the like, ooh, as, as Tony or as him hit the, the floor. And I ended up crossing the finish line with fam was right on my heels and it was crazy. And, and I think I was in disbelief at first. I mean, I, I knew at that point in the last lap that I was going to be top three. I felt, I felt that I was going to be top three and I was going to make the world championship team. I did not expect to walk away with the victory. So that was, uh, that was surprising and exciting and fulfilling all at the same time. Absolutely. Epic race for sure. And where was that one at? So that was in Eugene. It was at the old Hayward Field, University of Oregon, which that field is has been revamped and renovated and, well, more than renovated. It is the nicest track and field facility in the world at this point. And they, they're hosting the world championships this year. Nice. Next, this month, actually. We're going to go back a little bit. And yeah. I'm going to ask you what your favorite cross-country course was that you ran on in college. And can you describe the course? The Indiana University cross country course was my favorite and I got to train on it all the time. It was one of the most challenging. It was hilly. It was not always the best footing and it was, it was a beast. I mean, it was one of these courses where people did not want to run there. And I think that played into my love for the course because I was like, yeah, bring it on. You guys want to come to this course? Let's do it. I'll take it to you. So <laughs> I loved it, but it was um, 500 meters flat and then it went up a big hill and there was a 2K loop that was just rolling hills before it came back to the start line. The course swung around behind the start line and then it went into the sinkholes. So even bigger, more sharp hills. Uh, so by the time you ran 5,000 meters of this course, you had hit one, two, three, I'm counting here, three and a half, four, five, let's call it five and a half hills that were significant. And if you did a 10K on that course, because we hosted the, the national championships my senior year, you do a 10K on that course, you're running 10 hills that are significant. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a killer. Now let's uh, go back a little further. How about high school? I always remembered Fallsburg Park, the Lowell Invitational. And again, there were hills in that course, but there was one in particular where there were actually roots sticking out of the hill. <laughs> you literally put your hands down as you were climbing up this hill only to get to the top to find out there was another hill. It wasn't necessarily like a false flat, but it was, it was flat for a little bit before it hit another hill. I don't know. I just, I always loved courses like that, that offered you a chance to bury somebody. Like if you can be tougher, if you can like really stick it out and drive to the top of a hill or go flying around a corner where they can't see you, I always loved trying to, to play all of the tactics to try to beat somebody. 
Absolutely. Outworking everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Outsmarting everybody. Yeah. That's why I liked our home course in high school because yeah. it was easy once we got into the woods with all the corners to just turn on the jets a little bit. Yeah. But when that person behind you couldn't see you anymore, they just lost hope. Yeah. Especially when they're running through sand and it's like, yeah. oh, it's like holding me down, running through gum. <laughs> We're going to go back in time and talk about when you started with running. How did that happen? And can you walk us through any events that uh, you had then? Just before we started here, I've got this little trophy on my shelf here from 1986, right? It's this tiny little trophy. It's Fruit Portal Fashion Day's first place foot race. And that was the, uh, I don't know, that was a year where I think I discovered a race. Like, I don't know if I ever had an official race before and I walked away with a trophy. So, you know, positive reinforcement that next year, my mom let me run the 5k, uh, the fruit portal fashion days 5k. And we had an older boy run with me. I think it was because she didn't want me to get lost or anything and wanted to make sure I had support. And, And I got done and I thought that, well, this is pretty cool. That was a pretty major accomplishment. I ran the whole thing as far as I remember. And that was 1987. And I I think I ran that race plus the Seaway Festival 5K almost every year from then until the end of my high school career. And then it then it became a little bit more selective about which races I ran just because I had college training. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of it. Fruit Portal Fashion Days for years that even happened before I got into, you know, high school cross country or track and field. Was running always the top of your list, the thing you wanted to do? Definitely not. <laughs> I, yeah, we laugh, right? Because I think we both tried to avoid it, really. I mean, when I was young, I played football and I loved it And until I started. I wasn't the biggest kid in my class at some point, or at least on par with them. I think I started my sixth grade year. I was a little bit smaller than some of the guys, and I was, I was admitted I was a little afraid of getting hurt. But then I tried to go back out for football as a – seventh grader and I, I got mono right away at the beginning of the year. And so I had to put an end to that season real quick. That's also the year I started doing some middle school cross country because I knew that I could run. I mean, as a kid, I grew up around running around the neighborhood everywhere and I liked it. You know, it was, I don't know what they ran 1.2 miles or maybe one and a half miles. I even did middle school track because, you know, you do sports as a kid. And I remember I ran the mile in seventh grade and I ran 522. So that was pretty good. And then in eighth grade, they had me start doing the 3200 and I hated it. I was like, I don't want to do that. (laughs) So because of that, I didn't go out for track in high school or cross country. Uh, So instead I played, I didn't do anything in the fall. I played basketball and then I played tennis and I love tennis. But then Coach Johnson, you know, he convinced uh, you and me, I think in a similar fashion, he's like, just come out to practice once. If you like it, join the team. If you don't like it, then don't worry about it. So <laughs> he brings us to Hoffmaster State Park <laughs> with all the dunes and the trails. And I loved it. And it was fun. And I was like, okay, I'll join the team. And that was after, you know, calling me once a week during the summer, me telling him no over and over and over again. And that year I ended up sixth at the state finals, class B state finals. So it's like, obviously I've got a little bit of some natural ability to, to be a runner. And so when track season rolled around that year, I went out for tennis again. <laughs> and, uh, and Mr. Grossa, you know, a little Italian guy, he comes up and he's, he puts his hand on my shoulder. He's like, you know, Tommy, he's like, you did pretty well in cross country. Maybe you should go run track. <laughs> so I was like, oh. And it's like, I knew, I knew that I should be running track. Uh, I just didn't want to, I really didn't want to be a runner. So I don't know. You know, the, the crazy thing for me I was definitely naive and pretty ignorant back then in a lot of different ways. And cross country in my junior year, I did, it never even dawned on me that if I was sixth place as a sophomore, that I would be one of the favorites going into that next season in the state. It never even dawned on me. So I think I was surprised. Uh, I mean, I knew that I wanted to win races and I wanted to do well. But even going into the state finals, I think it never really dawned on me that other people expected that of me. And so I think when somebody... I feel like I remember somebody coming up to me and saying something about how they saw me last year and like, Hey, you're going to do great. You know, you're one of the favorites. And I was just like, what, like, how do you even know who I am? I mean, that was, you know, before internet era. So it's not like you could just check results 
you had to rely on newspaper clippings and word of mouth. What event as an athlete could be any time did you do that was challenging and fun at the same time? Are you looking for something outside of the steeple or like a specific race in college or anywhere, uh, anything other than what we've already talked about? Yeah. Let's talk about sleeping bear dunes. So <laughs> this will be maybe a little bit, not what you were expecting, but there was one year I went up to run the Traverse city cherry festival road mile. You know, they had the road mile. There was prize money. Actually, it was a pretty cool race because you could, if you were the first person across the line at the quarter mark, the quarter mile, the half mile, the three quarter mile, then there was a bonus that they would give you for being the first one across those. So that was a cool event. I thought at the time I thought I was in shape and I was like, man, maybe I can go run a four flat mile on the roads, maybe break four minutes. You know, I I was, I was in good enough shape where I thought that was a possibility. The roads are definitely a little bit different. So I, I ran, I think I ran 413 that day probably going through the 800 at like 202 or something like that. So it wasn't exactly my day. It wasn't the greatest race, but I was dead tired at the end of it. And on the way home, we stopped by Sleeping Bear Dunes. And if you've never been there, you know, it's like this, it's like the steepest dune that you could have (laughs) um, based on erosional properties. Right. And it's long. I mean, it's one of these things where if you've never seen it, you know, you go to the top and there's a lookout point. And you can use binoculars to go look at the people that look like tiny ants at the bottom of this hill. I was at the top and there's a sign up there that says, don't climb down to the bottom unless you, you know, you know that you can make it back up because it costs $3,000 for a helicopter to come down and get you. So I'm just like, oh, this is like really serious. And I'd never done the climb before. And I had overheard a couple older ladies talk and, you know, I'm kind of eavesdropping and they're saying something about, yeah, apparently somebody ran up from the, from the bottom and they did it in six minutes and 35 seconds, you know, and they were just amazed at how quick that was based on what they were seeing from other people climbing from the bottom to the top. I doubt these ladies had done it, but they might've known somebody that had just done it. And so I'm looking at it and I'm like six minutes and 35 seconds. And I think they had mentioned, like somebody had said that they thought that was a record. And I'm looking at it thinking, oh, there's no way it would take me that long. It's like, I'm pretty sure I could do it. And I was, uh, I was there with my uncle Bill and he's a big guy, six foot seven, but he's pretty athletic. And so we were like, well, let's go jump down to the bottom. So we jumped down and it's fun jumping down. Cause it's all sand, you know, all sand, you jump down and keep going, keep going, keep going. And you don't realize how big this sand dune is until you get to the bottom. <laughs> I mean, and there are people littering the path on the way up and they are sitting down catching their breath and they're dead tired. And so you get to the bottom and you look back up and you're like, holy crap, like this is a huge monstrous hill. And I had already run a race that day, only a couple hours earlier. <laughs> so my uncle Bill and I are down at the bottom and we're, we're talking about like, how much of a head start do I need to give him so that uh, we try to like finish at the same time? And I was like, I don't know, what, five minutes? Do I give you five minutes? And I was like, no, we better do a little bit more. And I think we, we agreed on maybe 10 minutes. So we're going to give you a 10-minute head start. Well, <laughs> 10 minutes came and went, <laughs> and he was only about a third of the way up. And so he gets to the point where you can see pretty clearly, there was a point where everybody just kind of stopped and sat for a while. You can see the marks in the sand and he looks, you know, he's tiny at this point and I'm looking up the hill and he just puts his hands up and shakes his head and he just sits back. And so I was like, okay, game on. It's going to be up to me, solo effort. And I start my watch and I just plow through this hill and I am, by the time I reach him a third of the way up, I am already dead tired and my legs are burning and I'm breathing heavy, but I'm just like, I am not stopping. And I go plowing all the way through to the top of that hill. And I got done at five, it was like five minutes and 35 seconds. So I got a a minute faster than that supposed record. And I started thinking about it as like, I doubt there's many people that have ever climbed it that, that fast. And I was pushing so hard. And and to me, that was uh, one of the coolest accomplishments that I had had. I mean, it's a, it's an unofficial accomplishment, but I'll call that the, the record. Five minutes, five seconds from the bottom to the top, Sleeping Bear Dunes. Heck yeah. <laughs> so the challenge is out there for all you young yes. guys. Yes, go, go do it. <laughs> go see if you can beat five minutes and 35 seconds. <laughs> I could probably look back at my running log to find an official. Actually, I've got my running log right here. I could find an official time. I, I probably recorded it. Whatever it was, it was fast as shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
how about as a coach, mm-hmm. any events that you've had that have been challenging and fun at the same time? All of it's a challenge <laughs> because <laughs> you're, I'm not in charge. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge in a certain way, but it's so much is left up to the, uh, the athlete in question. And it's hard because I can't, and we, we tell our athletes all the time, it's like, I can't get out there and run the race for you. So finding athletes, so it's part of the biggest, you know, the biggest challenge is recruiting. You find those athletes that are intrinsically motivated and they know why they're out there and they've got the drive to just keep pushing through anything. And sometimes they're a delight to coach. Sometimes they have their own ideas about how they should run races and you try to teach them the best way to approach a race or or different tactics that you could employ along the way, depending on how the race goes out. So the whole thing is a challenge. When I first started coaching, I was a volunteer at Indiana and I was doing that while I was uh, still kind of finishing up my own running career. And we had some amazing athletes. I mean, they were, they were top 10 in the NCAA multiple times while I was there. But I think it's, it's one of the things I'm most proud of too, is the, uh, you know, coach Helmer at the time, he's still there. He, in the fall of 2007, that was the first year I started working with them. He asked me if I thought I could handle the steeplechasers. And I said, yes. And so I had actually developed a whole training regime. I mean, we were pretty you know, like very routine and uh, strict with it. And I developed a group of steeplechasers that were some of the best in the NCAA. And I taught them how to hurdle. I taught them how to be efficient. I worked on their form with them. I mean, at one point, I remember we had nine men and nine women from the distance group all doing hurdle drills. Didn't mean that they were all going to steeple that year, but, but we had a lot of them doing steeplechase drills because it helped make them strong as well. You know, it's a lot of plyometric strength. And one of my assistant coaches, actually Deshaun Turner, he was one of my athletes there. And during his fourth year, so 2011, we had four of the top 10 steeplechasers in the NCAA. And they had run 835, 836, 840, and 842. And they were all in the top 10 um, on the descending order list, which was just an amazing group to be a part of. But I think that the the challenge was, you know, I'd never coached the steeplechase at that time, but I knew all of the drills that I had gone through. And I'd worked with a couple individuals along the way, including some training partners. And just, we took it really seriously, you know, slow motion video and tried to break down our hurdle form. It was fun. It was, it was where I discovered that I, I might have a, a knack for coaching. I'm trying to think if there were any other real challenging things. I started coaching the women and the men here at Miami and translating the times. Like I intrinsically knew men's paces. So we're going to do 10 by a thousand meters with a minute rest. I could tell you like, okay, we're going to run that around 312 with a minute rest, 312 per, per K for the women, I, I didn't know the paces. And so it took me a couple of years to finally, well, probably more than a couple of years to finally get to the point where now I can talk about thousand meter paces based on, you know, how good are the girls? What are the results that they're getting with their races? And how do I ultimately identify an appropriate pace for a tempo run or a LT reps or, you know, quarter mile? Like, I mean, I couldn't even have told you what pace they needed to run for a 10 flat 3000 meter. You know, I had to break out my chart. I've got right here, my pace chart, you know, I've got it all charted out so I can see, okay, well, this mile pace is this per quarter, you know, so there was a lot of things that I had to learn along the way. And I think that was one of the bigger challenges. And you overcame it. Yep. And we we're there now. I think I've got a really good grasp, grasp on paces for both genders. Nice. What other sports or do you think any other sports in the past made you better at running? basketball for sure a lot of lateral strength I played hard defense that was my the strongest part of my game definitely couldn't handle the ball well enough to to be a basketball player but uh, that lateral strength to me it was what gave me the ability to be a steeplechaser you know all the jumping as well later in my career I actually had what I thought was a career-ending injury in 2004 and it was you know horrible timing because I started that year um, that's what was that? Was that the Athens Olympics in 2004? Yeah, that was before Beijing was 2008. So before the Athens Olympics, which I really wanted to make that team. I started that year off running some of my best 3K times. I, I actually ran my PR in the, the open 3000 meters, ran 755. And I thought for sure I was going to make the Olympic team. But then I had a pelvic injury and it, the the doctor that saw me told me that 50% of the time, this is a career ending injury. 
And I was like, great, you know, that's not what I want to hear. Um, but I had the Olympic trials coming up. So I pushed through the injury and I shouldn't have, I should have taken time off. I should have swam. I should have been on the bike and let it heal. Cause I still had a little bit of time to still recover before the trials, but instead I pushed through and I, and I just was nowhere. I wasn't even in a position. I don't think I even made the final for the uh, Olympic trials and it was heartbreaking, but I quit, I quit running and I started biking a little bit, but then I, I was pretty mad. I mean, that was a rough time in my life. I was mad. I was angry. I was depressed. And so I bought a basketball and um, I was living out in California at the time, I bought a basketball and I, I started playing pickup games. So I started shooting around a little bit because I had, I was disappointed and mad that I had given up basketball because I loved playing basketball. And so I was out on campus at Stanford. I lived near Stanford and I was just shooting around and I started playing, but every single step that I took hurt. I mean, it was painful and it was like beyond painful, but I didn't care because I was so mad. I was like, I'm going to play regardless, because I might have to live with this pain for the rest of my life. That's how I felt about it. But what I noticed was that after two or three weeks of playing pickup games on a kind of a regular basis, the pain started going away. And I realized that what I was lacking was lateral strength. I think that I had become such a linear athlete. I was only moving straight forward. And I just didn't have the supporting muscles or the supporting musculature to handle only running. And so plyometric strength and lateral movement, I I discovered were extremely important for uh, stabilizing an athlete. So to me, that was the the proof that it was actually helping me in my younger years. And so I got stronger and I started running again and I still managed to eke out, you know, a few more years of professional post-collegiate running. So you you actually learned the hard way that you need some, some, (laughs) some cross training. Yes, for sure. What was the best investment that you made in yourself or maybe a parent, family member or friend made in you that was the most helpful to you along the way to get you to where you were as the elite athlete? Best investment was Coach Robert Chapman probably invested in me. Again, this might not be exactly what you're looking for, but um, when I was a sophomore at Indiana, I happened to be up in Indianapolis I was working, I was a, a counselor for Bob, Bob and Todd's running camp. Bob Kennedy and Todd Williams had a running camp and it was at the U.S. championships. And one of the steeplechasers at the U.S. championships actually broke his ankle during the race. And he was scheduled to go be part of this live high, train low altitude study that Coach Chapman was putting together. Now, Robert Chapman was a grad assistant with uh, Indiana before he took over. So this was still while Coach Bell was my coach, but I had already been on the treadmill. I'd been in the lab with multiple different things that Coach Chapman had been doing. So he knew who I was. And as an athlete, I had just gotten my first All-American certificate that year and ran 845 with the steeplechase. And so when Tony was not able to go to this live high, train low altitude study, they asked me if I wanted to take his place. And so I ended up going on the treadmill. We, We did a some VO2 max testing. Uh, we did a 3K time trial at, at sea level. We went up to live at Park City, uh, the Deer Valley Lodging in Park City, Utah. And we lived there for a month over the summer where we did a couple more time trials. And then we came down after 28 days of living high and training low and uh, did, so did some more testing. But while I was out there, I was, I was with, there were 28 athletes in the study and there were 27 that were post-collegiate professional runners and I was the only college kid. So it was a very, very cool experience. I think what I discovered on that was that these were real people. And if they can do this, I can definitely do this. So I I think it was just an eye-opening experience to me that one, I wanted to beat some of them. I didn't, I didn't get along with all of them, but I wanted to beat them because there were, there were a good handful of steeplechasers in that group, but there were also some really cool people and, you know, they were supportive and encouraging and yeah, it just, it kind of, it made them more human and, and it made the process of getting to that, that point more human as well. Thank you, Chapman, for putting me on the, on the list for that group. And I mean, it really helped. It helped that, me focus yeah. more. Yeah. That's a really cool opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Did anyone influence you to start running? You know, when I, 
had too much energy as a kid. My mom just told me to go run around the house a few times. So yes, my mom. We also played a lot of hide and seek and other games in the neighborhood. We had a lot of, a lot of kids in the neighborhood and there were a couple of meaner kids that would chase me down. And so I had to learn how to run fast to get away from them. And I, I, I can remember specifically one of them. <laughs> he was so frustrated because he couldn't catch me. <laughs> but I mean, he was mean. He was going to beat me up. So thanks, Derek. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, he, he had a lot to do with my early development as a runner. <laughs> oh, the bully turned you into a yeah. running, running machine. <laughs> That's but then funny. Coach Johnson, obviously, just for for being adamant and sticking to this idea that he needed to get me out on the team as well. He had a gut feeling and it was right. Yeah. When you started excelling in running, did mm-hmm. you look up to anyone, have a hero or an idol? I looked up to my, Mike Kramer that first year of running. He was a senior. Um, he ended up finishing fourth at that first cross-country state meet, and I was sixth place, you know, not too far behind him. I think he was probably a little scared of having the sophomore running up on him, but uh, yeah, I looked up to him, but then it, it, like I said, this was pre internet. So it's not like I could get online and look up running stuff. Then I learned about Bob Kennedy and Matt Justo and Ruben Rina and Todd Williams. I think coach Johnson probably shared with us some, I think he photocopied some, some pages out of a track and field news or something like that at one point. Yeah. And uh, I, I saved those. I actually might still have them somewhere so once i learned who they were i was like oh okay cool coach johnson was pretty good for us i think yeah definitely he took us to the olympic trials that's right after my freshman year and that was after your senior year yeah he you guys came picked me up in indiana yeah and then we went down to atlanta you and and coach and his parents we yeah we watched uh brian deemer in the steeplechase we met jim ryan yep outside the stadium yeah very cool that was such a cool experience it was yeah thanks coach johnson yeah thank you how many hours a week did you spend training when you were in high school not much i mean geez what did we run 30 to 35 miles a week yep i mean i don't i feel like I, i didn't keep a running log back then so i would i think it was before my senior year was the only summer that i trained because I was always doing summer basketball. Like that was a requirement. You want to be on the the varsity team or JV team, you had to do summer ball. And so I never trained before then. And same over the winter, I never trained year round because I was playing basketball. So it was my senior year that I decided to give up basketball, which was a hard decision. That was really, really tough for me. But I trained in the summer and I think I got up to mid forties. I might've had a 45, maybe even a 50 mile week, which was huge. But then back, like it was only a couple of weeks that were up that high. Yeah. And then we were right back down to that 35 miles a week range from what I remember. So yeah. it wasn't that much. Go jump forward to freshman year. And I know you had an even worse experience, I think, than me. <laughs> worse experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll call it a worse experience. I mean, I'm, I guarantee you there were weeks when I was running over 80 miles a week as a freshman. In college. If I didn't, yeah, in college, yeah. if I didn't skip my long run, because a lot of times I just got to the long run day and we didn't meet as a team. So, you know, coach would say, okay, go do a long run on Sunday. And, and I probably just didn't run most like half of the time because I was so dead tired. It was, that was an adjustment. Ours were Monday mornings and we'd wake up really early and he would put us in a van and drop us off like 20, 25 miles away from school and we'd have to run back. Oh, yeah, I'm glad we never had to do that. <laughs> How about as a pro? How many miles would you say you averaged a week? During my best stretches of training, I was in the 80 to 100 miles a week range. I mean, when I moved out to Eugene, Oregon in 2005, I had a really good stretch of training. I think I I always had trouble with getting the most consistent year after year after year training. But I was always, you know, I was either building up and I was very steady at the 70, 75 miles a week range. But then there were times when I was 80, 85, 90. And I, I, at one point I had a 100 mile stretch during a seven day period. It didn't fall on my calendar week. So I I never actually logged a hundred mile week. During those times, I was very high intensity and high mileage and high frequency. So it was like, it was 
significant training. I think I had built up to handle that. Like, I don't think anybody can just jump in and handle that type of training. Yeah, the majority of it was probably 75 to 80 miles a week. Speaking of pro, did you ever yeah. have any contracts and tell us about those? I did. It was my goal as a kid to be a Nike athlete. And as I became a runner, I, I came up with this idea that, you know, I want to, once I learned what redshirting was, I wanted to redshirt cross country once so that I would graduate in December of 1999. And what that, the reason why I wanted that is because it would give me the next six months to just focus on running before the Olympic trials in the year 2000. And I thought I'll graduate, I'll sign a contract with Nike. I always wanted to be a Nike athlete. And then I'll focus on the Olympic trials. And that's somehow exactly what happened. I mean, the red shirt came because I had a, a femoral stress fracture in my right femur. And so I was kind of forced to take time off. Luckily, we had a connection with Bob Kennedy. And I think Bob made a call on my behalf to get Nike. And uh, I signed a contract with Nike. So I ran on an independent contract for a few years. And then I was a part of a couple professional teams the Nike farm team, and then the Oregon track club just for a, a short stretch. The best part about having a good friend with a contract with Nike is you get some stuff every now and then too. <laughs> yeah. The, the box they sent me had a lot of clothes and it was way, way more than I needed. So I was able to hand out some of the gear to some of my teammates and old training partners. It was fun. <laughs> How many years did you spend at the pro level? So first with running, the, the term professional is kind of a, a loose term, but I did win money, which was nice. And it was all in all from 2000, I would say my career kind of fizzled out just because of some injuries, kind of faded in 2008. That was the last time I ran a steeplechase, but I was still training pretty intently and, and pretty heavily up till 2012. So somewhere in the eight to 12, range, 12 year range. And I have never officially retired, so I don't know what that means. But <laughs> What has been your most memorable race of all time, other than the win in U.S. championships? And why don't you walk us through that experience? There's, there's definitely a few that come to mind. There's uh, senior year cross country in high school, the cross country state championships. I was sick. I was sick a lot as a kid. So that one, I mean, kind of briefly, that one – Coach Johnson and I had talked about a tactic. We were just like, well, why don't you just hang back? You're not really sure how you're feeling. Let's hang back. And uh, maybe at two miles, if you're feeling good, go make your move then. Because we, you know, I was already a defending state champion and I think I was undefeated. I think you were the only one that beat me that year. And uh, <laughs> you let me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, um, I, I found myself not even a half mile into that race already at the front. And I was like, well, I was like, whatever. I was like, I'm just going to go now. So, you know, 5K cross country, pretty, pretty hilly course. And I just took off and nobody went with me. And I was, it was rainy and I was stomping through the puddles and I was just having a, a fun time, like a mile and a half into the race, two miles. I was kind of looking around and I was like, well, I'm just going to kind of cruise it in. So it was a very easy win for me. I mean, unfortunately, the same thing kind of happened my senior year. I don't know. I guess they're both memorable. My junior and my senior year 3200s were memorable because the the one on the track in my junior year, I didn't expect to win at all. And, you know, two laps to go in the 3200, we were 40 or 50 meters behind the leaders. And this kid from Cedar Springs, Ryan Watson, you know, he ran at Central Michigan. He was an All-American as far as I remember. He just took off. And within one lap, so 800 down to 400 to go, he caught the leaders and I just went right on him. I latched right on and went with him. And then he stopped when he got to the back of the, the lead pack. There were like three or four runners and I just kept going. And so I took off in that last lap. I think I ran 62 to close that last lap and I ended up uh, winning by, you know, 30 or 40 yards. <laughs> it was crazy. In this similar fashion, my senior year, I was sick again and I just didn't expect, I didn't expect myself to do that well. And somehow was able to pull it out that last lap and walk away with the win. So Those, that, that junior year race was epic. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. We, I think we can hear you on the video. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> both years. I think you're on the video. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting one because none of my family was there my junior year because I think we had a, a funeral 
well, was it a funeral? We either had a funeral or a wedding. I think there was a wedding. Let's call it a wedding. It's more happy that way. <laughs> but there was a wedding. And so they were all hanging back. And, and so we had it on video, a VHS tape. And so I remember showing up where everybody was and I played it for them, but I didn't tell them how I did. So they were all like, what? You won. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> exciting. You know, I definitely remember qualifying for Foot Locker because up to that point, I think that was the biggest accomplishment that I had had as a runner is my senior year, like the junior year we went over there for me in my junior year. And that was like an eye-opening experience. I had just won a state title in Michigan. And then I ended up getting like 97th in, at the Foot Locker Midwest Regional. And I was like, wow, these guys are good. And I thought I was pretty decent. That was, the, you know, that put me in my place for sure. And I trained really hard for that next year. That was my primary goal as a senior is to make it to Foot Locker. So I don't know how many kids get 97th and then they're like, okay, I'm going to make top eight next year. You know, that, that was kind of an absurd goal, but I did it. I remember that race pretty, pretty vividly coming down into the home stretch. And I remember crossing the line and I didn't know exactly where I was. I knew I was pretty close because only the top mate eight made it to the finals. And I remember looking around, you know, looking at the, uh, the guys in front of me and I was counting like one, two, three, four. And like once I realized I was seventh place, I just started jumping all over the place. I was so excited. That was fun. Absolutely. I mean, there's more. I can come up with a lot of other right. ones I vividly remember, but. Where's a place that you like to maybe run solo or with a group? Your favorite yeah. place? Anything stick out? I've got some really great loops. When I used to live in Palo Alto, California, who, if I can remember the name, Arrastadero is a really nice place. There's a, there's a ranch up in Woodside, California. Oh, I'm not thinking of the names, but there are some loops out there. But the one that I really like is Hoffmaster State Park. You know, what's what we have now, the Coast Guard Park, that wasn't even there. But I used to just go out and run the trails. I would follow the deer trails. And that's how I came up with some of these big loops that I would do out there. I mean, once I figured out, okay, on one edge, I've got the lake. On another edge, I've got Hoffmaster State Park and those trails, which I would recognize. On the south side, there was North Shore. So I, I knew that if I ever got lost on any of these trails, I'd just have to head one direction and I'd find my way out. So I was confident that I wasn't going to like get lost forever. And so I just went out exploring and, and discovered some of these pretty amazing trails that were off the beaten path. But, you know, you and I used to go out there and chase the deer. <laughs> so it was... Uh, it was fun. Sometimes I'd pick a, I'd literally pick a direction and say, okay, I'm going to run this way, not follow any path. And I would just run up and down whatever hills came in, in front of me. Yeah. Running the ridge lines. Yeah. It was fun. Heck yeah. I think there was one time when we were chasing deer where you were like, Hey, I'm going to go, you stay right there. Cause I had a camera. You're yeah. like, I'm going to go down the hill and I'm going to scare them back toward you. And that's exactly what happened. And I like was scared for my life because they were running right at me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like we still have that on a VHS tape somewhere. <laughs> I think, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> and you're like, oh, crap. Hey! <laughs> and you yell out and the deer like takes a turn. <laughs> yeah. I was almost yeah, taken yeah. out by deer. Who was your biggest competition along the way? It could be high school, college, pro. Tell us some of the times you went head to head. Well, in college, there were always guys that were better than me. Tony Familetti was was good. I, you know, once I got post collegiate, I don't think I was uh, consistent enough to meet these guys year after year after year. But Familetti, like even they, they dealt with some some off years. Tim Bro was pretty good, but then he stopped steeple chasing at some point. You know, in cross country in college, Matt Downen, he was the he was actually the Foot Locker champion that year that I made it to the Foot Locker finals. So he ran at Wisconsin. Jay Canton is at Michigan. John Schoenfelder was Wisconsin. And those guys, they were just so tough. I couldn't beat them. Uh, my senior year cross country at Big Ten Championships, I was fourth overall. And then I was going to run against those same guys again two weeks later at the, the regional. The only thing is then we added Notre Dame. So we had Ryan Shea. And Ryan Shea was this phenomenal runner you know, RIP, he, he's the one that, uh, if you guys remember in 2007, he, he collapsed in the Olympic marathon trials. And they said that he was, he was gone before he hit the ground because his heart just stopped. One of the best competitors. And uh, I got to see him train post-collegiately a little bit too, but 
those guys were so tough. So I got fourth at the Big Ten Champs. You had Ryan Shea in the mix. I got fifth at the regional. Same same order. I mean, it was tough. That was uh, that was a good, fantastic group of runners, and we definitely made each other hurt <laughs> when we were racing. <laughs> rivals in in high school. I don't know. I thought they were rivals. The uh, the Cedar Springs guys, but. I definitely was able to, they, they brought out the best in me. So Jason Quist, if you remember him, yep, that, that was actually what I considered to be one of my breakthrough races from a competitive standpoint it was uh, when he was, uh, he was laughing, he was pointing at me. I took over the lead, like at the one mile mark at our <laughs> regional at Big Rapids golf course. He apparently was looking at me like pointing, like, who is this guy? And, and coach Johnson was on the sidelines. And he's like, he was so riled up. He's like, he's pointing at you. He's laughing. He doesn't know who you are. He's pointing at you. You got to go. And so anytime I, I even saw a hand try to get next to me or try to take over, I would put in a surge and I would not let anybody take over the lead. And I have just pushed and pushed and pushed to the point where, like, you know how it is in cross country where you, you got your spikes and every once in a while things kick up behind you and you hear things hit the ground. Maybe, I don't know. I was two miles, two and a half miles into that race. And I thought he was still on my heels because I kept on hearing these things <laughs> behind me. And there was a, a 180 degree turn where I was finally able to, to kind of look over my shoulder and I couldn't see anybody. I thought this guy was like five yards, maybe five steps behind me. And there was nobody. I couldn't even see anybody. I finally was able to back off a little bit, but man, that it just, it really riled me up when anybody tried to beat me or tried to talk about how, they were the favorite. And if somebody was a favorite, I was like, yeah, well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it on. That's kind of like what Michael Jordan did through his career. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you love the sport and what keeps you involved in it? It's a good question, but it's also a very good and very clear answer. With running, running provides that sense of individual accomplishment. It's is difficult. It's challenging. So it really forces you to dive deep. If you want to be good at it, especially, or if you just want to be consistent with it, it, it forces you to face yourself every single time that you get up to go do it. And I think that it provided meditation. It provided introspection. It, it gave me that time to be on my own when I was on my own. It also gave me some of the best friends in my life. And so there was this team aspect of it. I, I like to tell people that running will teach you who you are if you let it. And so there's so many reasons why running is great and why I fell in love with it. Why I still go with it at this point, it's, you know, it continues to give me a challenge. I still find a lot of satisfaction in a job well done or the ability to help these other athletes now achieve some pretty amazing things. It's also just what I've done. I, I can't imagine doing anything different at this point either. I, like I've done some different things along the way, but I've also missed what running brought to me. So having a team right now, I've got, you know, assistant coaches to work with and some of them are some of my good friends as well. Did you ever incorporate strength training into your routine as a runner? Yeah. Yeah. We, we strength trained uh, in college, in high school, we didn't do too much, but um, in college it was pretty regular. We were in the weight room, core strength, post-collegiately, I always kind of stuck to the same type of routine. And I think it's important. You don't necessarily need to bulk up, but you definitely need to be strong with what you have. Do you incorporate strength training with your athletes right now? Yeah, we try to get into the weight room twice a week and they're supposed to be doing core strength at least two additional times a week. I, I personally don't think that you need to do core strength every single day. I think that there's some activation drills that you can do that are helpful on a daily basis, but I don't, I, I've never bought into the idea that you need to do core every single day. Thinking back to when you were racing pro, if you had a big race coming up, what did that race week look like compared to, you know, like an 80 mile week training? It depends on what time of year it was. Cause there were still some races where I was still running 70 to 75 miles that week. I remember once I did a, an eight mile run the day before a race out at, I think it was like the U S open or something at Stanford and somebody asked me how far I went. I was like, yeah, I just did, got done with eight. And he just looks at me. He's like, I thought you were racing tomorrow. I was like, I am. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So he was kind of surprised that I was running that far in front of, you know, the day before a race. The intensity, again, depending on the race, the intensity would definitely come back. I mean, maybe we'd do one full workout, maybe a half workout or do some prep work for the steeplechase 
I always like to do 400 meter hurdles or maybe eight by a 400 meter workout where every other one or maybe six of the eight were over hurdles just because I wanted to feel my pace. And so I would run them at race pace or goal race pace. There wasn't really a lot. I mean, I'd save the week before the race would be the more heavy, heavy workouts. But then we jump right back on it the next week. A little bit of a taper and then yeah. right back to it. Yeah. Do you incorporate any yoga, stretching, massage, percussive therapy, foam rolling, compressive therapy with your athletes' routines and the frequency of those things? Yes and no. Uh, we don't have like a set schedule for it, but you know we have a full medical department here. We've got physical therapists that work with our program and uh, athletic trainers and you know, we've got a couple of Norma techs that we float throughout the team for that compression. We leave it up to them to make sure that they're getting treatment. A lot of them have their own little trigger point guns and foam rollers and things like that. So we encourage that. We don't really have a set routine with everybody. So it's very much an individual basis. Gotcha. How about supplements pre-race or pre-workout? We don't use that stuff. I think it's something that if we end up getting a little bit of a bigger budget, then maybe that's something we can look into a little bit. We do use post-workout nutrition. So especially if they're going to go into the weight room after a workout, the, the university actually has a, a station for them where they can stop by and get some food. We definitely promote healthy eating and make sure you're hydrated because obviously if you're not well-fueled going into a workout, let alone a race, um, it's definitely going to affect the output. What was your favorite interval workout to do? Did you like the longer intervals or the shorter intervals? Don't know if I ever liked the shorter intervals. I mean, it was always fun running fast, right? Yeah. But they tend to hurt more. Yeah, they hurt in a different way. Plus, I was never super speedy. I actually grew to like 1,000 meter repeats with a minute rest or 45 seconds rest where it was cruising. I mean, I think some of my best K rep workouts were at like 252 to 255 per K. And so that would be 69 seconds a quarter, so 436 mile pace. And I would do that. I'd do 1,000 meters, take 45 seconds rest, do another 1,000, maybe do 50 seconds rest. And I would uh, I'd do typically up to, up to 12, but I'd do 10,000 meters worth of work. What types of intervals do you feel are the most beneficial to athletes that run the 100 meters? <laughs> so for the 100 meter, you actually have to work – very much on your strength, but you also have to work on your block starts. And so that's very much like a speed and power type of uh, workout routine. I'll leave that up to my sprint coach to handle most of that, but it's, uh, it's very different, different to the point where it's like a different language to me, right? Because they'll go out there and they'll work on their speed development and speed development is, I mean, really that's only 10, 20, 30 meters at a time. Once they get that speed development out of the blocks, then they transition to speed endurance and the speed endurance work is anywhere from 30. I mean, really it's, it's closer to like that 60 meters up to 120 meters. So it's, it's a different ball game. That's a different sport. <laughs> yeah. Distance run. yeah. Powerhouse. Yeah. How about 1500? So 1500 meter, you know, this is, that event is a combination of speed and, and VO2 max, but you can't neglect your lactate threshold. So you have to be able to tolerate lactic acid, like a high amount of lactic acid in your system all at one time. You have to have a heart that's going to pump as much oxygen to your muscles. You've got to be able to accept that oxygen. So you have to do very, very well-rounded training. And what we found is that our 1500 meter runners, some of the best of them, I mean, they're, they're still running 60 to 70 miles a week during the bulk of their year. We are doing race pace effort. We are doing 400 to 800 meter effort on different days, then we're also doing 10 by a thousand meters with a minute rest. So, and you have to do very well-rounded training. It's the, the mile and the three K those are very much VO two max dominant workout or workouts or races. Once you get over 3000 meters, now you're talking about a good balance between VO two max and lactate threshold five K and above that's lactate threshold. Yeah. So a 10, 10 K would be lactate threshold. Yeah, pro dominant. Yeah, but you, dominant. Again, even, even there, to be competitive at a championship level, you, yeah. need, you don't need just VO2 max and, and threshold. You still need that speed. I mean, they're closing in 52 seconds, 53 seconds to go win a championship. So right. how do you even do that? 
It's faster than my, that's faster than my 400 meter PR. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Actually thinking back to your days on the grind, if there was mm-hmm. one race you could do over. NCAA what championships. What's that? <laughs> 19, 1999 cross country NCAA championships. What would you have done differently? I would not have second guessed myself there. there so there was a point in this race. It was on my home course. It was my last race for Indiana University. NCAA championships, cross country. I don't know. There was something about this day where I knew I was going for an All-American spot, which was top 40. I thought I could get top 25. And 2K into this race, it was a 10K race. So one, it's on that course that I described earlier. Two, it's the race after that regional race that I raced those guys I described, you know, Ryan Shea, Matt Downen, Jay Canton. John Schoenfelder, and I got fifth at the regional. So I was in good shape. I had already run 30, I think I ran a 30-20 for 10K on, on the grass. 2K into this race, I, I was making a move, and this guy was not, he, I was like, hey, there's a gap, go do it. And so I, was, I would always talk to people in the races. I was like, go take that, because they're all going wide on this turn. I was like, this is my home course. It's like, I know, like, stay on the inside. And so I was trying to get this guy to get out of my way. He wouldn't go, so I surged in front of him, and before I knew it, I was on the front line. And I was like, oh, crap. I was like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be up in the front of this race. But I felt so good. I felt so effortless. And I found myself a step in front of everybody. And and this was like, you know, you got 180 kids in this race. And there's just a block, a wall of people at the front. Because nobody, no individual has taken the lead yet. You know, this the, the course is about 10 meters wide the whole way. And so I found myself a step and then two steps ahead of everybody. And... I was just, I couldn't feel the ground. I couldn't feel anything. I mean, I bet you my heart rate was 120 beats a minute. I just felt so good. And we're flying at, well, I came through the 5K at 1505. I mean, we were going three flat a K. We were going 450 pace or faster. It was faster. It was 448 pace. Hmm. And I I ended up getting a up to about a 25, maybe a 30 meter lead over the entire group of the best runners in the NCAA. And, you know, I was describing the course. We go behind the the start line at 3K. We go into the sinkholes, 4K and 5K. And during the sinkholes, I had this urge. In fact, I had this voice in my head just basically saying, just put in a surge. Like, you feel so good. Go put in a surge. Like, I, I could have picked up the pace magnitudes faster than what I was doing already. And I would have been able to pull away from this group before they even realized what was happening. And so what I would have done differently is I would have listened to that voice. Because there was a point where like, we go around this big turn and, and the crowd was, was thick. So you couldn't actually see around the turn. And I was in front enough where I could have hugged the edge of this course where all the people would have blocked the view. I could have put in a surge before they ever even knew what was happening behind me. And I feel like if I could have done that through both sinkholes, like you go down and up, you go around a couple of trees, you go down and up again. And these are major hills. I think that I could have gotten close to an 80 to 100 meter lead before anybody ever realized what what had happened. Or they would have been looking around like, do we need to go after this guy? Because like they might have known I was a steeplechaser. They were they were probably thinking, oh, it's his home course. He's just over eager. And so they could have let me go. I swear in my in my like to my bone, I feel like if I would have listened to that and if I would have put in those surges first, I would have come through 5K and I would have had a 100 meter lead on everybody. And if I would have just kept going, then I think that I could have, I don't, I'm not saying I could have won the race because David Kamani and some of these other guys that were just amazing runners, fine from Oregon, uh, Powers from Arkansas. I mean, there were some guys out there that were way faster than I had ever been. But I think that I could have finished in a top, a pretty solid top seven or eight if I had just gone and listened to that voice. Instead, what I said is, well, if I feel this good now, I'll feel this good later. Maybe I'll just back off and wait for the group. And so I did. I backed off and I, it, it took everything I could to just like kind of slow down and wait for them. By 5K, they had caught me and we came through 1505. And that was on, that was on course record pace, by the way. Bob Kennedy had the previous course record at 3009. And so we were right on course record pace. As soon as they caught me, you know what I said in my head? I was like, okay, now it's time to get serious. And literally before then, I was smiling and I was like, I can't believe this. I feel so good. And I was having a blast and I was having fun and I remember every part of it. But as soon as I said, okay, now it's time to get serious. Guess what? 
my whole state just completely changed. And these guys went past me and I was like, shoot, I can't, I'm finding it difficult to keep up with them. They hadn't picked up the pace or anything. In fact, I think the guy who ended up winning ran like 30 nine or whatever. I think he might've tied the course record or come really close to it. They didn't pick the pace up. They just kept it steady the whole time. And I found myself in the hurt locker right away. And I couldn't even keep up with the top group that was peeling away. And I ended up like struggling home to a 27th place. I still got the all American certificate, but man, I just know that if I had listened to that positive voice, that my cortisol levels would not have shot up and I wouldn't have, I would have been running on adrenaline the whole time. So yes, please let's rewind. Give me that race over again. <laughs> I agree. And you know what? Knowing you, I know you're right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it I would know. have been totally right. different if you would have just listened. Yeah. I try to tell people like, if you ever catch a flyer like that, where you just, you're just running high, go with it. Go. Don't think twice, just go with it. If you could well, have spent one week training with an athlete or coach during your prime days, who would it have been and why other than someone that you already had in your side? Well, yeah, I was, I was going to say Bob Kennedy, but I, I did train with him, not for like a whole week straight. You know, it, it was fun to do workouts with him. Post-collegiately, I ran some workouts with him when he was getting back in shape. I mean, he was sub 13 for 5K, so he was in a different realm. I think I had always wanted to train with the Kenyans to see what they did. So maybe not anybody in particular. I always wanted to kind of see what their routine was like. Absolutely. Yeah. I was actually curious about them as well. Yeah. Because they're so good. Yeah. yeah. They can run for days. What did you do pre-competition to get yourself ready and motivated? Did you do music, any mental visualization, any rituals? A little bit of music. Yeah, a little bit of music. I, I always wanted to be, I was more of a calm, get focused type of person. I didn't want pump you up music because to me, that was a waste of adrenaline. I don't need that before I step on the line. What I needed to know was like, I am focused. I've done everything right and I'm ready to hurt. Some people need that pump up music. That's fine. For me, I listened to Pearl Jam. There was a song called Indifference and it was like the lyrics are, how much difference does it make? I will hold the candle till it burns up this arm. How much difference does it make? You know, it's like, I'll scream my lungs out till it fills this room. How much difference does it make? And so for me, it was always, I'm going to go into this world of hurt. It's going to burn. I'm going to feel that lactic acid, but how much difference does it make? You know that on the other side of it, you're going to be just fine. Can you go deeper into that hurt locker than somebody else? That's what I needed. How um, bad do you want it, man? How, yep. how far in the pain cave are you going to go? Yep, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That's what this these endurance sports are all about, man. Yeah. <laughs> love it. I love climbing on the bike. Like, give me a hill that doesn't stop for nine miles. I love it. Right. <laughs> Oh, maybe that should have been one of our competitions. <laughs> yeah, I'll take you. I would probably take you on a road climb. I would I would challenge you there. All right. I mean, I, I would want a month to train. Oh, okay. So I've only been on six rides this year. So Yeah, yeah, I'd give you a month to train. Maybe we'll have to do that challenge. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. What recent events have you had athletes perform well in? And tell us about those events. We have a really good steeplechaser right now on the team. Carmen has, uh, she was placed placed fourth at the Spanish National Championships. She just won the U23 steeplechase for Spain. And she also came back the next day and won the 5,000. So she was a second team All-American this year. Just really kind of blew us away with how much she improved. And we also have a 10K girl who ran 33-38 as a sophomore and it's really only like her second or third year running ever. And we all, and we also know that she's so much better than that. But I think, you know, the recent past we've had uh, one of the strongest middle distance programs in the NCAA. We've had a whole multitude of sub 150, 800 meter runners. My fastest 800 meter runner was 145.80 last year in 2021. Yeah. We've just, we've seen some pretty talented athletes. It's been amazing. When you retired, was it good? Was it bad? How did you feel? Tell us about the process and the situation. Well, so like I mentioned before, I actually haven't ever officially retired. So I've never gone through the process. Unfortunately, with the injuries that I dealt with, it just kind of fizzled out a little bit. 
it was unfortunate because I still had a very strong desire to be out there working out. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. If I found out that I was still, if my body was able to handle the training, I would probably want to go do another steeplechase and maybe at the master's level. It's, it is actually, it's one of the three goals I had as, as a 40 something year old. I wanted to slam dunk a basketball. I wanted to do a triathlon and run another steeplechase. I've kind of dunked a basketball. I don't know if it could have counted or not. It was close. <laughs> I might still have to do that one. When I knew that my career was kind of over, I was working in a place where I actually was able to kind of rub shoulders with Steve Young, quarterback. I had asked him, I was like, when you retired, was it difficult? Was it tough? Because I was having a tough time kind of accepting it at the time. And he said, oh, yeah. It's like it was really it was really tough. And he, he mentioned that he had friends in the NFL that really – really struggled with it because they maybe didn't have a big, a a very clear picture about what they were going to do afterwards. We talked about it for a little bit and, you know, it kind of didn't necessarily make me feel better, but it made me realize like, this is normal. Um, You know, you're feeling pretty, pretty down and out about it. I definitely had to go through that because, you know, I always wanted to be on the Olympic team and I never made it. And I did, I represented the USA on four different occasions, which I, I'm very grateful for, of course. I mean, it was fantastic, but I also had to tell myself, I had to convince myself that that was okay. I mean, the Olympics are, you know, that's the, the top of the sport, especially for track and field. You know, that is like the <clears> Olympics. <throat> season, so. I think that you need to put the shoes back on on a consistent yeah. basis and get after that Fine. steeple goal, dude. I'm trying. I would love to do it again. I My body just, I need some medical attention with some of my old injuries that keep popping up, unfortunately. If you were to give advice to younger athletes, what would mm-hmm. it be? Diversify, do a lot of stuff. Don't just pigeonhole yourself into one sport right now. I think it's too easy up to that maybe sophomore, junior year. You want to do a lot of different things. Enjoy being a part of multiple teams. It is unfortunate that you know to get a scholarship, it's getting really, really competitive now. So that is a little bit unfortunate, but it'll make you stronger. And if you dedicate your time to it, if you really want to be an athlete going forward, you know, dedicate your time to it. And you'll, I think you'll find those positive results, but also understand that there really is more to life than athletics. Athletics can make your life very enjoyable. It can give you a community within your sport to have as some of your best friends in your support system, but it's, um, it's not the end all be all. And I think that's, you know, running has been a part of my life for a long time and I think it will continue to be, but there's also a lot of other things in my life that I enjoy doing. I, I, I have an artistic side. I, I like to write. I like working on my house. There's a lot of things that are, are worth learning and worth spending time on too. Diversify. As you know, we both have diversified. We yeah. don't just do one thing. We like to, to dabble in multiple things. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? I've always hoped that what I do with my athletic career can inspire somebody else. I know that it's done a lot for me in terms of, uh, you know, it's directed almost everything that I've done in my life. So it's been very rewarding. Dude. It it can teach you who you are if you let it, right? (laughs) From when you were a sophomore, you've inspired me with your athletic career. So if you've inspired me, you've inspired a lot of people. I don't think you have to worry about inspiring others. Well, hopefully I keep on growing and, accomplishing more and more with these athletes that I'm coaching now too. Absolutely. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you on the web? I am on Instagram. I think that's probably the best way. I don't do Twitter that much. Maybe I should, but yeah, Instagram, I think T Chorney is how you find me. T C H O R N Y. Tom, this has been a conversation that I've looked forward to and I'm glad we could carve out the time to do this. I honestly feel like we could talk for hours, but I want to respect your time. Gratitude for coming on here and sharing your story with us. I wish you much more success in the future. Appreciate it, Rob. I'll see you soon. Peace, and we're out of here. You have just listened to Unpacking the Athlete.